Persian War, the Peloponnesian War, the Corinthian War, all of these wars are over, so all of the grievances in ancient Greece are finally resolved, right? Well, not exactly. It always seemed like in ancient Greece when one conflict was resolved, a new kind of problem started. And what's the cliche? History has a way of repeating itself. And for the Greeks, this must have meant a new conflict was about to break out. But for the time being, at least there was peace. All the Greek city-states took an oath to keep the peace, and the Spartans remained the de facto power, and were, quote, the guarantors of the peace, as Xenophon put it. Sparta had achieved some of its most important goals. They broke up the alliance between Argos and Corinth, and added Corinth back to the Peloponnesian League. The Spartans also were able to break up the Boeotian alliance, much to the anger of Thebes. And Thebes was even forced to move back into an alliance with Sparta. Now, Sparta was determined to punish those cities that had caused them so much grief during previous wars. At the top of this list were the Montaneans, who had allied with many of Sparta's enemies in the past. In 386 BC, just one year after the conclusion of the Corinthian War, Sparta ordered the Montaneans to rip down their defensive fortifications. There was concern the Montaneans might side with Sparta's enemy in a future conflict. When the Montaneans ignored this order, the Spartans decided to launch an invasion. Interestingly, Agesilaus asked to be removed from the campaign since the city of Montania had been on friendly terms with his father. As a result, Agesipolis was appointed commander of the army for this expedition. In 385 BC, the Spartans invaded Montanian territory and devastated the surrounding territories. But the Montanians still refused to comply. The Spartans increased the pressure by setting up a siege around the city. A trench was dug and a wall was constructed. But there was a problem. Montanian had a massive supply of corn inside the city itself. The Spartans decided to raise the stakes. They dammed up a river which flowed right through the city. Parts of the city began to flood and the walls began to break. The Montanians finally relented and agreed to raise their walls. But Sparta, with the upper hand, refused. The Spartans now wanted the entire city broken up into smaller towns. The Montanians agreed to this latest demand since they really had no alternative. And so the wall was destroyed and Montania was divided into four smaller units. Xenophon states with quite a bit of sarcasm that, quote, so the transactions in connection with Montania were brought to a conclusion, and thereby one lesson of wisdom was taught to mankind, not to conduct a river through a fortress town, end quote. Now another incident occurred two years later in 383 BC that set in motion a renewed conflict between Sparta and Thebes. Sparta received several envoys from cities located in the Chalcidic Peninsula. They were being asked to join the Chalcidic League, which was increasingly dominated by Olynthus. Several cities, however, refused to join, and Olynthus was threatening them with war. The envoys thus appealed to Sparta for help. The rising power of Olynthus was viewed as a threat to Sparta, and therefore Sparta agreed to send a force to assist. Sparta also viewed this as a clear violation of the Corinthian Peace Treaty, which allowed independence to Greek city-states. One force was immediately dispatched to the Chalcidic Peninsula. Another task force was created, which was led by Phoebidus. While en route to the north, Phoebidus learned that Thebes was in a state of unrest, one of those typical factional disputes between the oligarchs and democrats. Phoebidus conveniently decided to camp outside of Thebes. Here, Phoebidus was able to meet with some oligarchs from Thebes. They promised to secretly guide the Spartans up to the citadel. Apparently, the proposal was just too much for Phoebidus to refuse. And as luck would have it, many of the Thebans were occupied with a festival. So the streets of Thebes were practically empty. This made it easy for the conspirators to lead Phoebidus right up to the Acropolis. Phoebidus immediately took control of the Acropolis and locked the gates. Amazingly, the Spartans now had a garrison in Thebes of all places. In any event, this gave added momentum to the pro-Spartan faction in Thebes, and they promptly arrested the main democratic leader, Ismenius. He was one of the most fervent anti-Spartans, but now he was quickly imprisoned. The rest of the opposing faction fled the city in terror. There was a general state of shock around Greece that the Spartans could violate the sovereignty of such a major city. Even in Sparta there was outrage at the actions of Phoebidus. He was accused of treason, having failed to proceed with his original orders to attack Olynthus. Now here is where Xenophon's account has to be called into question. He pins the blame squarely on the recklessness of Phoebidus. Plutarch, however, puts the blame on Agesilaus, indicating that Phoebidus was probably acting on the secret orders of Agesilaus. Is it really believable that Phoebidus all by himself would have ignored his original orders and thereby break Spartan's most sacred laws? I imagine that Agesilaus probably promised that he would protect Phoebidus from punishment. 
In any event, I think Plutarch's version of these events are far more believable, especially given the fact that Xenophon was a close and personal friend of Agesilaus. In any event, Agesilaus came to the defense of Phoebus. Agesilaus pointed out that he had done a good deed for Sparta. In the end, Phoebus escaped punishment, mainly at the behest of Agesilaus. But here is where everything began to spiral downwards. Agesilaus convinced Sparta to continue on with the occupation of Thebes. Sparta even decided to put Ismenius on trial. This was more of a show trial, and not surprisingly, he was found guilty and promptly executed. In 382 BC, the Spartans decided to get serious with Olynthus again. The Spartans were mostly successful in their early campaigns here, and even decided to set up a governor in the area. This would cement control over northern Greece. But the general mood in Greece was not good. Many began to see the Spartans as despots, the very thing that had led to the Corinthian War in the first place. In any event, the Spartans marched up to Olynthus in the Chalcidice. With the Olynthians behind their gates and the countryside effectively controlled by the Spartans, the Spartans decided to cut down some trees and devastate the surrounding territory. This was, of course, the usual tactic of an invading Greek army. Eventually, the campaign was cut off by the end of the summer. Xenophon relates that the Olynthians conducted raids against cities allied to Sparta and resorted mostly to pillaging and raiding, while still holding out against mighty Sparta. One of the raids, however, failed miserably. The Spartans were able to set up an elaborate ambush against the Olynthians. The Olynthians barely made it back to their gates, and with that, the Olynthians were more or less confined to their city, as their confederation had been ripped apart. And so the Spartans laid siege to the city of Olynthus. The Spartans again ravaged the area in order to lure the Olynthians out of their city. The tactic worked, but in a shocking setback, the Spartans were defeated, and Teleteus was killed. The survivors fled to nearby towns that were still loyal to Sparta. So this turned out to be a brutal campaign for Sparta. When news arrived in Sparta of the setback, another army was dispatched with King Agesipolis in charge. Agesipolis wasted no time and advanced against Olynthus. He took up the usual practice of pillaging the countryside. The harvest was destroyed and yet more trees were cut down. But in another setback, Agesipolis fell ill and died. Xenophon relates that the other Spartan king, Agesilaus, who had been an adversary of Agesipolis, openly wept. The Spartans sent a new general to Olynthus to carry on the war there. By 379 BC, the siege finally began to take its toll on the inhabitants of Olynthus. The Olynthians decided it was time to sue for peace, and as a result, they were enlisted into the Spartan Confederation. That meant they would be expected to provide troops to Sparta upon request. Xenophon relates that all of these events created momentum for Sparta. Thebes was under Spartan control, and now the most dangerous city in the north, Olynthus, was under the Spartan banner. And Athens was effectively isolated since she could no longer count on Thebes for assistance. Just perhaps the Spartan Empire could become a reality. 